got my coffee and now I'm ready. Hi, I'm Carolyn from Bad X Enterprises. Like, subscribe so that you get updated when I post new stuff. I'm so excited that you have joined me for the second installment. Um, if you want to check out the first episode, links below. Do that. It was a good one. Uh, for this installment, though, we get to talk to one of my very, 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 very dear friends, Becca Howe. She is an artist um, professionally, which is super, super awesome. So we are going to give her a Zoom call. Um, I hope you love her as much as I do. She is a total joy. So get ready for a lot of stimulating art talk and probably Lord of the Rings quotes. Yeah. Probably like do a, a kind of an intro. Okay, action. <laughs> so this is my dear friend Becca. We have actually been chatting for seven hours already, yeah. um, so we're very Give slack happy. <laughs> so Becca and I met when we were both at Northern Illinois University in our undergrad years, which were my only years and then she went on to be very academic and go for <laughs> graduate studies as well um day one all moved in walking down the hallway and i heard somebody shouting i'm just gonna put pictures of my cat on everyone's door and i said can you put some on my door that person i don't think i ended up even doing it i think you i did. like no you legit did did. oh yes. okay so we met because of her cat He's a he's a fashion boy. He's a fashion icon, and he like desperately never wants to look where you want him to look. What's on his bandana though? Uh, he, they're just like little leaves and branches. Oh. Because you know he's a he's a woodland elf boy. Also, we were supposed to all wear bandanas today. She and Kitty are wearing bandanas, and I did not. Yes. So, this interview is already potentially cursed. <laughs> Let's figure out the plot here. I have my questions. <laughs> I know I have my questions up here next to me. <sighs> But I also just still am really disturbed about the animated Lord of the Rings and want to talk about that. But it's it it put me through an emotional quandary that I wasn't prepared to face. <laughs> but now I feel like I'm a more complete fan because You've I suffered. too have suffered. <laughs> My brain function is like 40% Lord of the Rings, 30% art. Uh, 30% kitty at any given moment. Like, that's, that's what perfect. it is. Well, at least you know the division of labor <laughs> in your mind. Yeah. That's good. Okay. So, Becca, you create a lot of art, uh, typically traditional media style. Mm -hmm. um, I love your colored pencil work, but also every single thing that you make. <laughs> so pretty. Um, yeah. A lot of your subject matter is, you know, inspired by the natural world, mm -hmm. which there's no shortage of inspiration in the natural yeah. world for art. So when you're inspired by something, what does that feel like to you? So how do you know you want to explore a subject artistically? Yeah, I feel like I, like, out of everything, operate under, like, a very sort of visceral sense of curiosity. Like, there's so much in this world that is so little and interesting that we have this tendency to kind of overlook, uh, especially like in the natural world. I find that so interesting. And I just want to capture these little, like little tidbits of things that you find. Like, I feel like I've always been a treasure hunter because we would, yeah. like my family, we grew up outside. Like we grew up camping. My parents threw us in scouts from like, as soon as it was a viable option. <laughs> and like, 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 go buy babysitting. Can you take my um, child? <laughs> please, please, please nature, please adopt my child. But I feel like I've always been a nature hunter. Like, finding like going out on a trail and picking up acorns and like rocks and twigs and dead bugs and things like that. And there's, I don't know that, that like sense of curiosity, the sort of uh, cabinet of curiosity things has always been a, a primary motivator for me. I have, I don't know. I'm like not interested in, in making work about like, politics or anything like that there's a lot of like 
stress from just reading the news and I don't I'd rather make art that makes me happy than art that makes me stressed <laughs> you don't want your blood pressure going so, up while you're driving yeah, like I I love hiking and I love being outside like that's like my place of solace and if I can invite that into my home and my art practice that's only going to be something more authentic for me if I try and make work that doesn't feel authentic then like what's the point in doing it kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah and have you have you had experiences with those feelings of of creating stuff for whatever reason that you feel is unauthentic uh well I, I mean like you mentioned earlier I I got out of grad school about a year ago and there's There's certain school, I, I don't know how to describe, there's know, like certain, there's a certain ways of operating that depending on who you encounter within the academic world, they kind of want you to make work in different ways. There's different schools of like how you should function as an artist. And some feel that like before you create anything, you need to think out every single statement that you're making. How does this work operate under every single context? You need to do a lot of upfront kind of thinking and planning and your work should always relate to humans and it should relate on a political, social, economic, it should function on all of these levels. And then there's the school of thought that's like, you just need to create something. Like mm -hmm. if you spend all of your time thinking you're going to have a bunch of abstract thoughts, but nothing to prove for it. Mm -hmm. um, you should just let your hand make and you'll discover the meaning along the way. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I operate is I just, I have this innate sense to just create something. Like if you're not creating something, then you're not really like, to me, I don't feel like I'm, pushing myself if I'm not physically creating something yeah. and I'll kind of discover the meaning of it along the way. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people wanted me to function in the opposite way when I was in mm -hmm. grad school. They're like, you need to, your work needs to um, function on these 12 complex layers of meaning first. And if it doesn't have all of these layers of meaning first, then you shouldn't be creating it. Um, operating like that feels more inauthentic to me because I don't always put a ton of thought into <laughs> everything I do. Sometimes it's like, if I want to draw a bug, I want to draw a bug, so I want to <laughs> draw a bug. Like, <laughs> yeah, this bug can operate in, a, in, in other contexts of like, oh, maybe it's a political commentary on whatever, like, mm -hmm government's made of bugs I don't know um, maybe that's what you read into it but to me like I just want to create something that's gonna be something that I I react more viscerally to is just like interacting with artistic practice in that sense yeah and, like all these quotes from you know from Picasso from all these artists that are revered now you know after their death mm -hmm. Picasso was pretty <laughs> famous while he was alive but they're, they talk about that. They talk about how it's just an instant outpouring and you don't have mm -hmm. to have a lot of thought and you don't need to have a preconceived notion. I mean, like I think about even some of the more political artists like Warhol mm -hmm. and Duchamp and things like that. A lot of it, they were, you know, very conceptual in our eyes oh, now. Yeah. yeah. But there wasn't a lot of thought going into it and they got in trouble in their time for being not thoughtful in their artwork. It's also, I mean, it, it, it's sort of a byproduct of kind of the shifts in the art world that we've had, especially in the past, you know, 30 years, this, mm -hmm. this postmodern sense of creation that, I mean, especially today, you can't control who sees your artwork. You can't yeah. control how people are gonna react to your artwork. I think it's important to invest thought in what you are creating to kind of have that sense and that understanding that like, yes, people are mm -hmm. going to read into this, mm -hmm. um, depending on what their background is, what, where they're coming from. Uh, a person can't divorce themselves from their circumstances their, or their, their sort of engagement with the art world or their engagement with any sort of topic. You have to like function with that awareness. 
-hmm. but you can't control it. Like everyone puts their own spin on things. That's part of being part of a, a, a postmodernist, a contemporary art scene is that we're in, in we're inundated with people's opinions all the time. Oh, um, yeah. Like that's the point of kind of the internet and sharing your stuff on the internet. I think if you allow yourself to be bogged down 100% all the time about what people think, then how are you going to feel confident to create anything? Um, I think you have to operate from like yourself first and like your own desire to create rather than think 100% about your audience first. I don't know. Yeah. It's a, it's a very strange um, tension that any sort of artist plays with is balancing their audience and their own sort of uh, desire to create. Yep. And so. <laughs> I mean, I feel that tension the same way. I, like I prolifically that that <laughs> desire to create is something that I experience all all the time daily. Of uh, like you know whether it's artwork, mm -hmm. textile work, any of those things. But that, that tension, though, too, the, the self versus the mob, that's mm -hmm. so present even in marketing. You know, a lot, of, a lot of business owners that I work with, that's one of their biggest reasons that they don't market themselves mm -hmm. is they're afraid of, okay, well, I know what, sometimes they know what their audience wants, so they want to present that, which mm -hmm. is or they think they know what their audience wants and they want to present that, which then feels unauthentic to them. And they're like, well, why would I do it? It feels yucky or it's too much work or something like that. When the reality of it is if your audience wants, you know, stock photos, unless you're a stock photo company, yeah, <laughs> you're not talking to your right audience. And that I think translates to the art world. Too. It's very much about striking that balance. It's hard for people and it's different for every person of, of how you sort of compartmentalize. Like, no, you shouldn't operate just like with a complete sense of unawareness of how you're communicating with others. Yes. <laughs> um, you, you ha like if you're going to be creating a, a work that is political or, or, right. or vaguely like a, a commentary on anything, you have to be aware of who you're talking to and you have to be aware sort of of the history behind this thing but it shouldn't stop you from at least you know entertaining these thoughts yeah. or like why you feel compelled to talk about this subject or whether you have the authority to talk about this subject I think mm -hmm. you have to like speak from a sense of, of, of awareness and authority and, and sort of things like that no matter what you're sort of creating mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I absolutely it's, it, it's a it's a conversation I've had a lot of times with with other people in in the art field is like what you're allowed to make work about or like what feels real or what feels Loud, yeah. again like uh, authentic to talk about. Um, you shouldn't be creating work just to like cause a stir if it doesn't mean something to you. But if it means something to you, then like go ahead and cause a stir. Like that sort mm -hmm. of that sort of balance too. Mm -hmm. And and some of the balances like within the art or creative world in general, I think are really interesting how they're constructed in our society versus how they've existed over time. Um, like one that I think has gone back and forth and like this is, you know, obviously very personal to me because this was an experience I had early on in my artistic journey that had a huge negative impact mm -hmm. on me was the balance not just between what you're creating and who's seeing it, but the balance between the method of creation. So the art versus craft debate. So I, tiny bit of backstory, I went to undergrad to study a bunch of different things. One of the things was I was getting a major in fine arts with an emphasis in fiber arts. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky at the time because the the dean of the fiber arts program was on sabbatical. That doesn't sound lucky, but the professor who was the interim kind of head of that department told me that uh, I should think about changing my degree track. She said that when the other 
uh, person returned from sabbatical, she would hate everything I made and would make it very hard for me because she didn't believe that uh, textile arts or fiber arts should ever exist as anything besides an art form. They should never have function, which is intrinsically different from how I believe and what I want to create. And that was very heartbreaking for me. And the, the professor who told me that said it from like a place of great compassion and caring. She wasn't trying to be mean or discouraging. She was very honest. She's like, not that she thought that I couldn't do it. She's just like, it's going to be very hard because this, this other person was notorious for if uh, printmakers or painters were taking a paper making class from her she would fail them if she found out that they painted on the paper or printed on the paper that they had made in class because the paper was the art. And the art world is very, it's strange. Like yeah. it's, it's got a lot of different approaches of what people find is important or like what people should be doing. Yeah. Like there is, I, I know I definitely like, I still struggle with calling myself a part of the art world. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, like, like I've, I've been in galleries and things like that, but there's such a like strange sort of tension and a, an a approach to the quote art world. Cause like you said, there, there's some people who believe like art should have no function. Like yeah. if it has a function, it is not a work of art. Mm -hmm. And then there's others who strongly believe like if it's a creative outpouring, if mm -hmm. it's something that somebody felt compelled to do, then it's a work of art. Like yeah. Yeah. there's a lot of like strange gatekeeping to in within the art world and like what's determined to be sort of better than others, um, especially in terms of craft, because like mm -hmm. as somebody who embroiders myself, anything that has sort of those mm -hmm. sort of connotations of the fiber world or, yeah. or we've, we've talked about it, something that is deemed quote women's work. It has no place in the fine art world. But then if you take two steps over into the fibers world, it's incredibly welcoming and opening. And like, there's, I mean, sure there's strange parts of that that probably have been yeah. keeping within yeah. it, but like I've had a really positive experience within the yeah. sort of fibers community. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've had a very negative experience of trying to incorporate fibers into my sort of studio practice within a sort of academic context. I, yeah. It's, Which is, it's that to me, that's very interesting because a lot of these things, you know, if you go like strip all the way back to it, I think humans are innately creative. We want to, mm -hmm. we need creativity to survive, like come yeah. up with a solution to this yeah. problem or you die. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, Whoops. Yeah. And I like even ancient art, cave paintings, like it's a desire for adornment. And that's mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily functional, but maybe it was. Maybe it told a story or was steps to a remedy or something that was survival based. So does that mm -hmm. then not become art? I mean, I have a much looser opinion on mm -hmm. what is what is an artist than some people, although I'm very aware of of like you said, the gatekeeping. But yeah. Some of that too, like, I love to ask people why then there are housewares and things like that included in art galleries. Mm -hmm. Why are those things there? Or when you go to history museums and you see beautiful textiles and, you know, woven tapestries and things like that, they're adorned, but they're functional. Why are they there then? Mm -hmm. you know, somebody at some point deemed them art. So why has that changed or when was the shift and I mean I don't think there's any answer any specific answer to that but I'm, I mean like it, it it stems a little bit of like you think of of times of like the sort of the renaissance where art and craft were intrinsically so yes. linked like the frame was just as important as the artwork that was being created mm -hmm. like you take a mm -hmm. you take a, a da Vinci piece and the ornate carved gold frame they were both commissioned and they're both kind of paid for at the same rate and they're both considered to be incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like sort of this splitting between art and craft, it's 
not like a new thing, but a, still a relatively new thing within mm-hmm. the sort of timeline of art, like maybe stemming back to maybe the 1800s. Um, we have this sort of diversion between crafted objects and high art as this sort of stem of modernism. And we say as contemporary artists that like, no, there's no division of, of art and craft anymore. Like there's no hierarchy of mediums. Anyone can create art about anything and it can be made out of anything. And that's sort of the point. But we say these things, but it's still met with a certain amount of hypocrisy. Like yeah, there's yeah. still, there's still very much a hierarchy of media that I feel like a lot of people are breaking down, but Mm-hmm. It's sort of ingrained in into this sort of gallery structure in a sense. And maybe I'm speaking out of my ass here, but like I it's coming from a lot of my personal experiences mm-hmm. of my my whole thing, like my graduate thesis um, was a body of work that was all colored pencil. And I was like colored pencil is my favorite thing in the entire world. Like it is my medium that I have been doing for, you know, 10 or, 15, 10 or 15 years at this point. It's my favorite thing to work with because I, I just love the process of it. And when I first sort of announced to the, the, the people in my ghost, oh. <laughs> when I sort of announced that like I was going to make my body of work colored pencil, um, I was met with a lot of backlash. Really? Uh, yes, because I was told time and time again by a fair amount of different people who were in my my sort of cohort and my um, set of professors and, and people that colored pencils is not an art medium. It is not something for finished artworks. It is a, I think it was deemed, it is a preparatory medium in that your final artworks should be something that is much more elevated, aka it needs to be a painting to have worth within a fine art context which is so strange and stupid like (laughs) so I fought and I was like no it I'm gonna do colored pencil I don't it's gonna feel so like for one I don't have as strong of skill in oil painting as I do Mm -hmm. in colored pencil I've had much more practice doing colored pencil um and I fought and I, I I I created the this body of work and a couple people in particular like didn't believe me until they saw the, they they saw my final sort of thesis presentation and they pulled me aside and they were like, these look like paintings. I'm you really, you really turned me around that colored pencil. It can be an art, art medium because these look like paint. Had they never (laughs) never seen your work before? Because I mean, like to me, there's so much obvious care and attention and time that goes into it that yeah. I don't feel, I mean, like it's really bizarre to me that somebody would be like, Oh, this isn't a, an elevated media. Like, I mean, pencil drawings hang in art. I think it's a, it, a lot of it is like, again, it's personal preference. We all yeah. have our personal preferences in the fine art world. We all have, sort of our opinions on what mediums are better than others Mm -hmm. and like um maybe again it it goes back to gatekeeping but i i mean i was fortunate i my sort of thesis committee um was three incredibly strong ladies who i have so much respect for and they got it like Mm-hmm. They were like, yeah, it makes sense to do it in this medium. And I, I think if I didn't have those three people on my my committee, I would be a much different artist. But they were so supportive. They kind of got why I wanted to do what I wanted to do or why I was so drawn to the medium or like why I thought it was important to make work using a, quote, you know, craft media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, like I, sh- I, mean, I don't speak for for everyone and say like, oh, nobody thinks that colored pencil is a, is an important medium, or nobody thinks that embroidery or or fibers are important mediums. It's we all have our own personal sort of struggles or mm-hmm. our own personal sort of experiences with other people in the art world that sort mm-hmm. of shape how we view media. So yeah, I think I just had a straight, <laughs> I had a strange one. <laughs> I, I mean, like I think 
that some of those some of those are are valid and and I wouldn't say universal, but you know more prevalent. I know yeah. the art versus craft. I mean, even when I was in high school, I had a really really awesome art teacher, mm-hmm. and she warned me. <laughs> she was like, yes. "Get ready." <laughs> She's a professional artist as well. I mean, she doesn't just teach. She's in a, a painting guild. Her medium is mm-hmm. all different types of painting. So she, you know, one of the fine artists. Mm-hmm. And she she warned me and prepared me for some of that, which was nice. But yeah, I, I was kind of, and that, and I, I dropped out of school. So that was kind of part of it, was feeling very disillusioned about going to college and expecting this open-mindedness. And I mean, art is subjective and I knew it would be, but I oh, was yeah. hoping yeah. that it would be something that there was open dialogue about how subjective it was. You know, that whole thought, like, it's almost kind of absurd. If you truly if you truly wanted what a lot of academic artists talk about is, you know, that open, free thinking, exploration of ideas, open sharing of technique, things like that, you wouldn't go to a college if you wanted that. I I wouldn't. I would seek that somewhere else. That sort yeah. of environment. And I mean experiences like that, like your experiences and my own experience, they've like one thousand percent shaped me as a teacher because I mean my my initial undergrad was in art education and um, now like as somebody who teaches community college it is so important to me to always have a sense of compassion and like operate from a sense of nurturing above anything else because i'm sure a lot of the students that that i come across or like anyone who comes through the academic system they probably have those misgivings about like where do i fit in or like am i making work that's important i think um for me, it's super important to allow people to express whatever they feel is important to express at that given moment. I don't like shooting down people's ideas immediately. Cause I know I've had tons of professors that'll just shoot you down like that. Yeah. Or say that what you have to say is not important or compelling enough. I think there's something compelling about anything someone has to say if they invest enough time and thought into it about, you know, why they want to say these things or like, why do they feel compelled to use that media or like, what are their background interests because that motivates Mm -hmm. us as creative people. I think telling someone that they can't make work about something or that that what they want to do is not valid is only going to serve as a disservice. Like you Mm -hmm. need to, you need to nurture people to create something no matter what it is that like totally shapes me as a teacher and how I, I, I approach like my students of never sort of crushing their dreams before they have a chance to dream about it. And is that something that you explore openly with them? Do you talk about, um, you know, in a professional way, some of your experiences with the art community and different gatekeeping experiences and how they should prepare themselves for that? Or like what, what kind of societal like standards come with saying I'm an artist? Do you guys talk about that? I, I mean, it's, it's, sometimes a little bit hard or weird to talk about because there, let's be real, there, there are, I mean, certain, certain stereotypes around artists or like um, knowing kind of what you're getting yourself into. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, nowadays there isn't necessarily, I shouldn't say there isn't necessarily a stigma around artists. Because for some people, yeah, like you're going to encounter people in life that are like, oh, you're an artist. When are you going to get a real job? Like mm-hmm. there's tons of people out there. I encounter that still. People have been at this for a while. Like, oh, you're an artist. So you live in poverty, right? Like, yeah, but whatever. <laughs> um, I'm not on the street yeah, today. <laughs> in an inherently creative society and I think that's what's so brilliant about things like Instagram and YouTube is it it is giving a voice to people who didn't know that they had that option maybe when they were little or like maybe they have grown up sort of entrenched in in the media society um I think giving people a voice or giving people sort of permission to create or Mm -hmm. or or telling them that they have lots of options to create and share with others. It's a really beautiful thing. Like 
you made a dumb doodle and you want to share it online, do it. Like yeah. you're, there's no sense in being ashamed of being a, a creative person, despite the sort of stereotypes of like, you're never going to be able to support yourself and your life will be sad right. forever. You'll be a depressed little bean the rest of your life. <laughs> and and I, I think some of that is super interesting because now more than ever, there are so many tools available to yeah. artists to create, you know, and that's a whole other argument of like the, the monetization of creative expression. Like we could talk about that for hours, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, Christy and I talk about that all the time, this like bridge between like commercial art and yeah. fine art and like that sort of, even the stigma that surrounds that of like, yep. if you create work to support yourself as an artist, you're not a real artist in the fine art world. But if what you create that even mean? fine art, <laughs> what does that mean? Yes, we we have had this conversation on like a weekly basis. I don't know. Maybe I have maybe I have like a a very sort of almost too whimsical view of like art. Too whimsical. Come on. Too whimsical. Like art because cup, I think unicorn cup. <laughs> I don't know. I like I strongly believe that like people should create and like who am I to tell them that like they shouldn't be allowed to do something and like I jump from media to media all the time because I like yeah have art ADD of like I want to do mm -hmm. everything all the time like you know if you have this this creative uh inclination go for it right you know and like you're gonna have a lot of missteps along the way but if you didn't have those missteps they're not they yeah. wouldn't have led yeah. you to where you are. Yeah, we're going to learn. Exactly. Like, if, if you want to learn how to embroider one day and make stickers the next day and do watercolor the day after that, like, I think everyone should be able to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Art isn't for the intellectually elite anymore. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think if you kind of operate with, with that sense of, like, you know, art should only be this one thing, mm -hmm. then that is so limiting. And you're, you're, I don't know. I don't feel like I have the right to tell anyone what they should do with right. their passion, you know? Yeah. Like, just do something. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not going to stop you. As long as you're not hurting anyone or like, completely misspeaking or trying mm -hmm. to represent what you're not, have the authority to represent like go ahead and do it we operate of like sometimes he really hates me all the time look at this is our matching bandanas he's have his, he's like please please don't reach out i don't want to be done hey let's show off your bandana my son is uncooperative. Okay, so, goodbye. <laughs> that was all we're gonna get from him. <laughs> Talking about the art world and like, I almost sometimes shy away from like having these serious conversations about art because there is so, uh, like even going back to your comment about like this control of knowledge, there there yeah. is a, a there is a certain amount of like control of knowledge in the art world, or like um, everyone has these sort of hard opinions about, you know, as 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 someone who has gone through sort of the whole academic cycle of art from mm -hmm. taking an intro class to graduating with a master's, like. I should, I should be a certain way. Like, I feel like there's people out there who think that I should be a certain way at this point, or I should hold certain values because of my experiences. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily agree with everything that I have, have uh, sort of been entrenched in. And I have like a very tenuous relationship to this sort of quote, fine art world that I like sometimes don't feel like talking about it because I don't want to voice my opinions because of the inevitable sort of intellectual backlash. I don't yeah. know if that's what you would, yeah. what you would deem it. Like, I know that, that if there's certain people who hear me talking this way, they're like going to lose respect for me as an artist because I don't mm -hmm. adhere to 
quote, the standards, or like, I do embrace soul so wholeheartedly, a vast array of media and a vast array of modes of expression. Like I, I, I try my hardest not to be a gatekeeper of the art community because I, I have encountered a lot of people who have had negative experiences with art or like yeah. who are so strongly opposed to showing their work in a gallery or, or sort of communicating with, with these sort of authorities of art. Um, and I don't want to be one of those people. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to deem what's important, what's unimportant or, or anything like that. Or like, yeah, I still, I full will admit that I, um, I shy, I shy away from some of these conversations sometimes because of the, the connotations that they, they can bring. But it's fun talking with someone who understands or like yeah. any, someone who is open-minded uh, about these sort of things. Like open-mindedness is, is key to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I super appreciate you, you chatting about them. I know I, some of the topics can be, you can easily get, I, I speaking for myself, you, Carolyn, you can easily mm -hmm. get riled up about them. Cause I did have a pretty negative college experience. I loved my time and loved what I was mm -hmm. learning, but it was not what I expected and not what I was, I was told to expect from an academic institution. Mm -hmm. And that could have just been the school I was going to, or just, there were great professors. I mm -hmm. like, I still think about a lot of the stuff we talked about in our poli sci class almost <laughs> weekly. Almost too, almost too much sometimes. <laughs> yeah. We, well, I mean, like some of the things were really what I had expected from a school, but those were so rare. That's what led me to be like, this is a waste of my time and money. And I got very disillusioned about the art world and um, mm -hmm. what being a curious person meant the kind of having that ownership, you know, like you're talking about mm -hmm. having that ownership of, and I avoided talking about school for quite a few years after I dropped out just because I was embarrassed to a degree. I never regretted my choice to mm -hmm. leave school, but I was, there's so much connotation with, Oh, you quit college. <laughs> um, but yeah. And like, don't get me wrong. Like I don't, I don't regret any of the educational experiences mm -hmm. that I've had. I know I, I, I was harping on earlier about like, yeah, I had some pretty negative yeah. stuff. Um, I did have some negative experiences, but honestly, I, I really love sort of the journey that I have ended up taking because even these negative ones have only strengthened my yeah. convictions. And like, if I didn't have people challenging me, yeah. if I didn't have people criticizing me, it wouldn't have forced me to think about these sort of interesting questions or like, these these impetuses for creation or or any of that like i i have met some uh, like really incredible professors along the way who like have opened my eyes to different avenues and who have pushed me and like especially some of you know these ladies that i had in, in grad school yeah. like i am like i don't even know if they know how much of an impact they had on me as a person and as an artist um and like these artist friends that I've met along the way too are some of the most incredible people that I I wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet if I didn't sort of take this, this path in life. Um, yeah, everyone had everyone has their own different experiences and they sh they shape us. Like that's what it is about being an artist and being a creative and being a human too. And, and being a human. <laughs> and some of some of that, like I I hate those questions of like, do you regret like why would you ask somebody who's sitting why? sitting in front of you alive, do you regret something? Because that's, that's opening a wound that maybe is already healing, you know, that's, yeah. that's questioning, like, are you upset with who you are today? That's not okay to me, like as a person. No, that like, is a, that is a perfect way to phrase it. Like, are you, are you upset with the person you've become? Like, okay, cool. Why don't you just turn the knife a little deeper there? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, and I don't think that it's always born out of the spirit of, yeah. you know, negativity. People want yeah. to know, I think the better question from that 
that standpoint to kind of get some of the exploration is what about that journey impacted you, you know, whether it's negative or positive. And I think that is something too, that, you know, a lot of artwork is created out of great pain Mm -hmm. or great, you know, big feelings about Mm -hmm. something and exploring that in a way that's healthy and allowing yourself to feel the feelings and to go through that and then be able to talk about it on the other side. Yeah. Like that's, to me and like mental health is super important to me too and that's like that's why art matters to me is it's an extension of your emotional and mental being Mm -hmm. which is really weird to say out loud (laughs) it sounded better (laughs) in my head a little deep here no i mean you're you're absolutely right and like um i know we all we all kind of of shift what we're making artwork about as life sort of affects us. And I know that like my, my, my sort of body of work since, since graduating a year ago, it, it, it's taken a sort of like a, a tangential path to, to what I was creating before. Like in, in, in school, I was making work about landscapes and things like that. Yeah. But the landscapes and nature things that I'm doing now are coming from a different a different place and they're coming from a different need to create and a different need to connect with nature um, that almost feels like more personal to me and like coming from a, p- a more pure sense. Cause now I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm creating work that is like stuff that I'm like super, super just excited to explore. And again, like going back to our, our conversation 8 million years ago yeah. of like, I feel like I operate mostly out of a sense of like curiosity and intrigue and like my intrigue comes from, you know, natural history and like natural history museums and like yes. this community of citizen scientists that I I'm like starting to become more interested in is so like it gets me really excited I I I love that 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 connecting with just like a almost childlike sense of wonder of of these little natural objects that feels super authentic to me now compared to what I was making for quote academic reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of stuff. Well, thank you so things. much. Thank you. Joining. I'll let you know when it goes up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye. The animated Lord of the Rings movie. It's horrifying. Aragorn wears like this very very short skirt and you get a lot of panty shots <laughs> are you thinking about Viggo Mortensen panty shots when this is happening I mean that would be fun this is like a terrifying <laughs> <laughs> this is like a terrifying I don't know you need to watch it I'm gonna mail it to you <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>